Good morning, everybody. Happy Palm Sunday. Welcome. My name is Andy McClellan, one of the pastors here at Damascus Community Church, and we are glad that you're here with us. Uh, if you're a guest with us this morning, welcome. We're glad you decided to worship with us this morning. We'd love to know that you were here. And so if you do us a favor and fill out a communication card, you can find those at the welcome table in the back. In fact, there's going to be a lot of things this morning at the welcome table in the back, through the double doors to the left. Uh, communication card, if you'd fill that out, just drop it in the offering box. We'd love to know that you were here. Uh, or you can find that online. And so if you're joining us on the live stream, you can do that on the homepage of the website. Uh, click on the Contact Us button, and that will uh, get you to our online version of the communication card. There's a lot of things going on in the, the life of the church. This is a special week for us, as this is Easter week, and so today is Palm Sunday, where we, where we remember that Jesus went into Jerusalem on his way to the cross, and then this next weekend, we'll, we're going to celebrate Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. And so we'll have one service, uh, 7 p.m. this Friday for uh, that Good Friday service, where the theme will be the agony of defeat. And that doesn't mean pain in your feet, that means the agony, sorry, the agony of defeat, lamenting, sorrowful, discouraging, as we think about what the disciples were going through as they thought that this Messiah had died, and, and oh, he had died, but they thought he was gone, and that he wasn't who perhaps they had hoped he would be. Uh, then we're going to celebrate the thrill of victory on the Resur Resurrection Sunday as we recognize Jesus did rise from the dead. He is who he says he is, and we get to celebrate that. And so Friday at 7 p.m., um, we would love to be able to pray for you during that service. And so we'd love to pray for those things that might be discouraging for you right now. Uh, maybe those things that you feel like you've lost hope in, just as the disciples were feeling like maybe they had lost hope. And so what we'd like to have you do is, uh, there is in the DCC newsletter as well as on the website, site. Uh, there's a form for you to fill out if you'd like to answer the question as to what you're discouraged about or what you're hoping for. We also know that people like paper, and so uh, we still like paper. So we have these flyers that explain a little bit what we're asking, and on the back side, uh, it has lines for you to fill out what your laments are, things that you're discouraged by. They're out on the welcome table through the double doors to the left, and if you'd fill one of those out and then put it in the offering box, we will use those to, to craft our prayers for that night. We will not read your confidential responses, but we will come up with prayer themes uh, based on those. And just a reminder, because it is Good Friday, we'll, the office will be closed uh, at noon this Friday. Many of you know that as a part of our desire to be a haven, a place to find healing in Christ, uh, we're wanting to grow in our ability to help families experiencing do domestic abuse. And so for that reason, we're partnering with a ministry called Call to Peace uh, to host a special training seminar here at DCC on Saturday, April 20th. Uh, it's going to be from 8.30 to 12.30. Uh, this seminar will discuss uh, how to identify and care for families experiencing domestic abuse. And so if you'd like to be a part of that, um, you could pull out your phones and, and scan that QR code, or there's posters around with that uh, code on it with the information about the event. Uh, or you can fill out a communication card and let us know that you'd like to be there. Uh, or on the website, there's a link that allows you to register online. We'd love to know who's coming, and so please plan to do that. That next weekend in April is our men's getaway, and so it's going to be a busy month, uh, April 26th through 28th, uh, men's getaway at Camp Morrow, and so this is a great time of studying the scriptures and fellowshiping together as guys. Uh, we'll have food and fishing and firearms and fun, and you come up with the other Fs. There's lots of things that we'll be doing. Uh, motorcycles, various games, lots of different things. Uh, Sign-ups will be in the foyer. Ben Landolt's out there. He's got some flyers in his hands that he'll hand, uh, make available to you. If you want more information, fill out a communication card, and we'll make sure to follow up with you. And then finally, this morning we're starting a new ministry, and I'm excited about this. Uh, women's ministry is beginning a new ministry about uh, praying for your kids and grandkids for grandmas. And so Grandma's Pray is going to meet today after the second service. You'll go through these doors into the prayer room, and they're going to pray for kids and grandkids and do this every fourth Sunday of the month. And so yet another opportunity for the, the body to get together and to pray together for the needs uh, in the church and needs in your families. And so please take advantage of that. Well, speaking of prayer, we should pray together. Let's do that. Father, thank you for the gift of being able to come together to worship this morning, to uh, highlight the things that you're doing among us and in us. Uh, Lord, we would ask that as we have announced various activities, Lord, these are all intended uh, to worship you and to create disciples, to make disciples 
here in this area and, and around the world. And Lord, it's for that reason that we're excited about a missions trip, a missions team that's leaving this afternoon. Uh, Lord, thank you for Jonah and those who will be leaving for Federal Way, Washington to minister in, um, in various ways, cross-cultural contexts, uh, ministering the streets, Lord, helping others to see the hope that comes through a life in Christ. Uh, Lord, as they'll be reaching out to Afghans in a certain community there, we ask, Lord, that you would use them. And Lord, thank you for the churches that they'll be partnering with, for, for Christ Church and for Connections Church and Pastor Jonathan Lee. Uh, Lord, may you bless that partnership. We ask for uh, fruit, not only in this ministry, but in uh, the ministries of those churches in the future. Lord, that you would protect them and then bring them back safely with stories of your faithfulness, of how your hand worked, and, uh, and Lord, that this would be part of the development of disciples here, that, that those who go would come back with an excitement to follow you more faithfully. Lord, we're so thankful for the opportunity to celebrate Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday this next weekend. We ask for those services, but Lord, we would also pray for those among us, uh, those that, that are part of our family, uh, family circles or our friendships that don't know you. Uh, Lord, those who may come for those services because it's just what they do on Easter. Uh, Lord, we would ask that you would use uh, the messages, you'd use the music and all the things that we do to penetrate through the hardness of heart that may be there and that you would open their eyes to the truth. Uh, Lord, that they would uh, not simply attend church, but they would become part of the church by uh, turning their lives to you, that they would repent and give their lives uh, completely and, and unashamedly to you to use for your glory. Lord, we want to see that in our family members and our friends and those who will just come in from the community. Lord, would you use those services for that purpose? And the Lord, we pray for our message today for Pastor Asa as he brings it. Lord, as we think about Jesus, the, the sacrifice that you made for us to pay the penalty for our sin, as we think about the fact that you and only you could be that perfect atonement for us because you are sinless, you are a lamb without defect. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would help us through this message to understand the depth of our sin, that we would understand the greatness of your grace, and we would understand the, the high price that you paid so that we might have life with you. And so, Jesus, we call out praises to your name. We say, Hosanna, would you save us? In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Why don't you stand as we worship this morning? I want to encourage you to, to raise your voices. Lift your hands up if you feel led. Uh, clap along with us. Um, pretty sure that's not a sin. I think the Bible actually encourages it. I checked. It's not on the list. It's not a sin. If you clap in timing, it's making a joyful noise to the Lord. So if you feel led, go ahead and do that. So let's lift him up this morning.
You took all that on your shoulders. We praise you because you didn't stay there. Three days later, you were raised again and proved that you, you are and were who you said you are. The creator of this universe, the creator of us. Thank you for loving us that much to do that. We praise you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning. You may be seated. 
Our scripture reading this morning is from Leviticus chapter 16, verses 1 through 34. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of two of Aaron's sons when they approached the presence of the Lord and died. The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron that he may not come whenever he wants into the holy place behind the curtain in front of the mercy seat on the ark or else he will die because I appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Aaron is to enter the most holy place in this way with a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He is to wear a holy tunic and linen honored garments are to be on his body. He is to tie a linen sash around him and wrap his head with a linen turban. These are holy garments. He must bathe his body with water before he wears them. He is to take from the Israelite community two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Aaron will present the bull for his sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household. Next, he will take the two goats and place them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. After Aaron casts lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for an uninhabitable place, he is to present the goat chosen by lot for the Lord and sacrifice it as a sin offering. But the goat chosen by lot for the uninhabitable place is to be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement with it by sending it into the wilderness for an uninhabitable place. When Aaron presents the bull for his sin offering and makes atonement for himself and his household, he will slaughter the bull for his sin offering. Then he is to take a fire pan full of blazing coals from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground fragrant incense and bring them inside the curtain. He is to put the incense on the fire before the Lord so that the cloud of incense covers the mercy seat that is over the testimony or else he will die. He is to take some of the bull's blood and sprinkle it with his finger against the east side of the mercy seat, and then he will sprinkle some of the blood with his finger before the mercy seat seven times. When he slaughters the male goat for the people's sin offering and brings its blood inside the curtain, he will do the same with its blood as he did with the bull's blood. He is to sprinkle it against the mercy seat and in front of it. He will make atonement for the most holy place in this way, for all their sins because of the Israelites' impurities and rebellious acts. He will do the same for the tent of meeting that remains among them because it is surrounded by their impurities. No one may be in front of the tent of meeting from the time he enters to make atonement in the most holy place until he leaves after he has made atonement for himself, his household, and the whole assembly of Israel. Then he will go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. He is to take some of the bull's blood and some of the goat's blood and put it on the horns on all sides of the altar. He is to sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times to cleanse and set it apart from the Israelites' impurities. When he has finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting, and the altar, he is to present the live male goat. Aaron will lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the Israelites' iniquities and rebellious acts, all their sins. He is to put them on the goat's head and send it away into the wilderness by the man appointed for the task. The goat will carry all their iniquities into a desolate land, and the man will release it there. Then Aaron is to enter the tent of meeting, take off the linen garments he wore when he entered the most holy place, and leave them there. He will bathe his body with water in a holy place and put on his clothes. Then he must go out and sacrifice his burnt offering and the people's burnt offering. He will make atonement for himself and for the people. He is to burn the fat of the sin offering on the altar. The man who released the goat for an uninhabitable place is to wash his clothes and bathe his body with water. Afterward, he may re-enter the camp. The bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought into the most holy place, to make atonement must be brought outside the camp and and their hide flesh and waste burned. The one who burns them is to wash his clothes and to bathe himself with water. Afterward, he may re-enter the camp. This is to be a permanent statute for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you are to practice self-denial and do no work, both the native and the alien who resides among you. Atonement will be made for you on this day to cleanse you, and you will be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is a Sabbath of complete rest for you. You must practice self-denial. It is a permanent statute. The priest who is anointed and ordained to serve as high priest in place of of his father will make atonement. He will put on the linen garments, the holy garments, and make atonement for the most holy place. He will make atonement for the tent of meeting and the altar and will make atonement for the priests and all the people of the assembly. 
This is to be a permanent statute for you, to make atonement for the Israelites once a year because of all their sins. And all this was done as the Lord commanded Moses. Amen. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, worship team. And thank you, Noel, on the slides back there. That was, uh, that was a, a long passage to go through, and so we're, we're grateful for your ministry to us all. Turn uh, in your Bibles with me to Leviticus 16. That's where we'll be today, and so we'll continue to point there. If you want to uh, stick a marker or something in Hebrews chapter 9, we'll turn there. Uh, at some point in the message here. Uh, while we're doing that, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord. Lord, we need your help. Oh, this is a weighty tax. This is, this is heavy. Um, but Lord, we need to hear it. We need to delight in your holiness and in your goodness. We need to abhor our sin and be horrified by it, and we need to uh, sense the relief given to us in your son, Jesus. Father, I, I pray the people of Damascus Community Church, Lord, may we know the cost of what we've been forgiven. May we know the cost to you. May we know the cost to your son, and may we walk in love and worship and holiness because of it. Father, be with me as I open your word today. Help me to be faithful. By your spirit, apply the word to our hearts. Help us to spit out the bones. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Have you ever had to meet someone really powerful and important and you feel the nerves and the butterflies in your stomach and you don't know exactly how this thing's going to turn out? And so maybe you practice and rehearse and maybe you have all sorts of strategies of picturing people in their underwear and things like that. <laughs> or maybe you, you, you've gone in front of people and not had any idea of who they were and how powerful they were. And maybe you, you, you did that, maybe it went okay, or maybe you embarrassed yourself. Well, I can remember when, when I was in high school, my dad worked for a company called Ingram Barge there in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, they had a company picnic, and the families were invited, and so we all come to this company picnic, and one of the highlights was a tour of a barge. And so there's a barge there on the, the Columbia River in Nashville, and so we, we, we get on the, this barge, and, and we go in the bellies of the, of, the, of the beast there, the belly of the barge, and, and here are the machine, we put in earplugs, but you get to feel the power of this machine. And, and uh, on, on our tour, a, a stocky older gentleman joined us, and, and, and he was along for the ride, and, and, and my dad, being very friendly and gregarious, uh, would, would, wanted to engage him, and, ah, oh, hey, how's it going? And so my dad's really tall, and he's, uh, this guy was stocky, and so my dad towers over him, talking down to him. And so th th this was the way that the tour was going, and dad, dad showing interest in this man. And we, we get through the tour. We come out in the sunlight after, after the belly of the beast there, out in the sunlight, and my dad notices he's got an Ingram Barge polo on, so this man must not just be family, he must be part of the company. And so he, he sees an Ingram Barge hat on the guy, and so he says, oh, do you, do you work for Ingram Barge too? And the guy lights up a cigar, he says, work for it? I run it! <laughs> it's a little embarrassing when you mistake someone and you don't know who you're coming before. But it's a much more serious matter when you come before the creator of the sun and you come unprepared or you come by your own merit. The Bible tells us we will be crushed if we approach in this manner. And we ended last week, and we're in our 1 Corinthians series, and we ended in 1 Corinthians 6. And this, this, uh, the last verse that we read was this phrase, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. 
Now, there's a, there's a lot of talk about prices today. You've got inflation going on, everybody's worried about the price of gasoline, the price of groceries, the price of houses, the price of hotels, and it's all coming to a fever pitch. But oughtn't we to have more concern over the cost at which we were bought? Paul tells us that, that we were bought and that it was costly. And we, we ought to have concern over that cost because there's a scene in, in Luke 7 where this, this, Jesus is dining at a Pharisee's house and this, this sinful woman comes and runs to Jesus and falls at his feet and she's weeping tears and, 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 and washing his feet with those tears and drying them with her hair and anointing him with oil and kissing his feet again and again and again. And Simon is repulsed. Simon the Pharisee there is repulsed by what he sees that this sinful woman is kissing Jesus' feet, that, that Jesus would actually let him touch her, or touch him. Jesus says to him, Simon, I, I came into your house, and you did not wash my feet. She has. You, you, you did not kiss me. She has. You, you did not anoint me. She has. She loves much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. See, this, this, this cost compels this love, and this love compels our worship, compels our living. Now, what is clear is that Jesus was not telling Simon that, that Simon, you're less sinful than this woman. That's why she loves me more. That's not what he's saying. He was saying that this, this woman actually recognized the exceeding sinfulness of her own sin, and Simon was blissfully unaware of the disparity between his character and God's character. He's dining with the God of the universe, and he's judging him. Well, might we be like Simon? We, we, we don't like to think of ourselves as helpless. We, we don't like to think of ourselves as sinners in the hands of an angry God. And as a result, we misunderstand the grace of God for us. And so can you see how, how, how our love, like, like Simon's love, might grow diminished? Can, can, can you see how our, our worship might grow small and campy? Because if we want to be mastered by mercy, we must first stand condemned before a wrathful God. Understanding the depth of our poverty, the depth of our need, our utter inability to please Him, and then His grace is a sweet relief. It's life. And so today, I, I, I want us to think on the terrifying holiness of God. So then that we can celebrate his great and gracious provision for his beloved people. My longing today is, is that when we hear God's word, when we hear of what the cost is, that, that, that our love for Christ will blossom that our worship will resound, not just in this room, but throughout the week. And our holiness will increase. The hope-filled, glorious message of this text is that all that God demands, He provides for His people most fully and finally in Christ. And that's, those are the three points of this message. All that God demands, He provides for His people most fully and finally in Christ. So, number one, all that God demands. So I want us to understand the importance of the next several, how, how important these, these next several verses that we read are, because Leviticus 16 is at the center of the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch was written by Moses. It's the first five books of the Bible, Penta, Pentateuch, um, and it functions as sort of a mirror to itself. It, 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 in Genesis, you have us kicked out of the garden. And then Exodus, you have 
God's people journeying towards Sinai. And then you have Leviticus. And then on the other side, you have God's people journeying away from Sinai. And in Deuteronomy, you have them coming back into the land. So it functions as a mirror of itself. The, the scholars call this a, a chiasm or chiasm. I don't know the pronunciation. If you're smarter than me, you probably do. But it functions as a mirror. Leviticus is the exact center of the Torah, of the, the Pentateuch, of the first five books. It's the exact center of it. And Leviticus 16 is the very center of the center of the premise of the Bible. So this is, this is an important text that we're reading. This is an incredibly important text that we're reading. The central text answers the question of how a holy God can dwell with a sinful people. And that's been the big question hanging over God's people ever since God said, you are my people. And he takes them to Sinai and they worship a golden calf. And God says, out of the way, Moses, I'm going to destroy them. And Moses pleads for God's people. He's like, don't, don't destroy them. Because you promised to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, you promised. And it's your character on the line. And God says, yes, but my character, my holiness will destroy this people if it dwells with them, if I dwell with them. And so you see the tension. How can a holy God dwell with a sinful people? I'm sorry, I, I got lost here. I'm going to have to, there we go. Bookmarks are wonderful things. So you see the tension that, 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 that is created here, and this text is answering that. And Moses really wants to hammer that home because the book of the Leviticus is divided perfectly in half. The, the first half, verses, chapters 1 through 15, there's 18 times this phrase, the Lord said or the Lord spoke to Moses. Look at verse 1, the very center. The Lord spoke to Moses. That's the only time it appears in this text. It appears 18 times before that. And in chapters 17 through 27, the second half of the book, the Lord spoke to Moses appears 18 times. We're in the exact middle of the book. It's really important, the point that Moses is driving home here. Right off the bat, the Lord calls our attention back to the previous chapters. He's been building a case. And he calls us back to, to chapter 10, where Aaron, the high priest's sons, Nadab and Abihu, they approached the Lord with their own plan. God had given them detailed instructions about how to approach them. But they say, no, no thanks, God, I got this. I, I, I think this is a good plan. I think you're going to really like it. Here's what I'm going to do. My version of things. You're welcome. And that's blasphemous. That's, that's offensive. Because it puts us in the seat of God. In fact, God gives detailed destructions. He's not arbitrarily pulling this out of a head. He's pointing forward to his son, Jesus. And so when they reject God's instructions, in a way, they're rejecting the one that all these instructions are pointing forward to. They're rejecting Jesus. They think they got a better plan than God. They think they got a better plan than his son, and so the Lord strikes them dead where they stand. They're consumed by fire. And Aaron can't mourn them. Because God is so holy. He says, if you mourn in my presence, in my joyful presence where life is, you'll die, Aaron. So Aaron holds his peace because the Lord is just. And, and, and following that scene in, in chapter 10, you have chapters 11 through 15, which are a lengthy discourse on bodily emissions and why you just can't have these things and then be near the people of God. There's a cleansing process. Why? It's because God cannot be near our uncleanliness. He's holy. He's other than us. He's not common and so this reference in verse 1, back to chapter 10, is also built up on all the commands that take place 11 through 15, the chapters 11 through 15. And what we really need to see in all of this is that God is holy. Brothers and sisters and friends, God is holy. We, we, we might kind of casually live life and, and not think too hard about that, but God is holy. 
And His holiness will be vindicated. But it's, it, it's worse than that. God's, God's not just holy. We are bad. To put it simply, we in our sin nature are bad. And I don't just mean like the, 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 the doctor at Planned Parenthood on McLaughlin Boulevard right by my house there is bad, and, and he is bad. He's very bad. But I mean that you and I and Andy McClellan, we are all very bad in our sin nature because sin is not just the bad things that we do. Sin is the bad motivations in our heart when we're doing good things. Do you feel the weight of your sin before a holy God? Do you understand that if you were to enter into his, his presence like so, that you would be cut off? See, brothers and sisters, statements like what we see in 1 and 2 and, and, and in verse 13 and in, in chapter 10, uh, of, uh, or else he will die. That's a warning for us. That's, that's actually a helpful weapon for us in our battle against sin. Because it shows us the exceedingly sinfulness of sin. And we're constantly tempted that God is the God of life, the author of life who created everything. And we're constantly tempted to, even when we desire things that are good, to, to try to achieve those good things by walking away from the path of life on the path of death. Do you know to walk away from the author of life, to insist on your own means is to ask for, to prefer death? We need to take the attitude that, that Puritan John Owen had when he said, we must be killing sin or it will be killing us. Now in, in chapter 16, we've gone through 10 through 15 here, but in chapter 16, it's time for Aaron to pay attention because the Lord gives these instructions in verse 2 and 3. He says to them, you can't come to me whenever you just want to come. You can't come before me in the way that you want to come. You can only come to me in this specific way. Brothers and sisters and friends, we cannot draw near to God without his initiation, without his call, without his revelation, without his provided means. That's the message of the Bible. That's what God tells us again and again and again. He calls us. We don't like Nadab and Abihu insist on our own way to God. We don't casually stroll before him. He calls us by his revelation and he tells us how to approach him. And that's what Israel's learning is, is so different about the Lord. In, in Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 14, I, I, I have that on the screen for you there. He tells them that they're not to practice witchcraft. They're not to practice divination or, or necromancy because what is the essence of those things? It is man reaching out to the gods, trying to manipulate the gods to get favor, to get, to get a prophecy, to get a word from the gods. But God is not like that. No. Not at all. And neither can they manipulate God by adultery or by child sacrifice or by, by cutting or cursing themselves. No, the Lord is gracious in that he calls us and in that he provides the means to come back to him. He initiates us. He reveals himself to us. We don't, we don't conjure him up. We, we don't initiate him. There is no God like the God of the Bible who condescends to his people, who provides the means, provides the way back to him. And in verses 4 through 5, we begin to see the premonition of what those means are and what that cost is. That brings us to number two. He provides for his people. 
So the, the, the question of how God can dwell with his sinful people has come up again and again. We saw it in, in Exodus 32 there. We see it again as the people rebel again and again and again and God's wrath breaks out toward them. How will God in his holiness and justice draw near to a people who would be destroyed by that very perfect justice? And here in the, the, the center of the Torah, the center of the Pentateuch, you don't have law. You have atonement. You have atonement. You have atonement for this specific people who would dwell with God, who would be his people. You have atonement for their specific sins that are confessed over and laid upon one, uh, another. And so the Lord begins to describe the ritual observance of this, this, this special day. It's called Yom Kippur. It's called the Day of the Atonement. And he gives this, this description in, in, in them in, in, uh, of the day, an overview in 6 through 10, and tells them what's about to happen. In the next chapter, in Leviticus 17, 11, I think I have that up there for you as well, the, the, the Lord tells us that blood represents life. The life is in the blood, and it's given as an opportunity for atonement, life for life. It's given in exchange for our lives. And that's exactly what we see mapped out in chapter 16 and verses 6 through 28. A life for the lives of God's people. And so 6 through 10, we have that overview of what's about to happen. And here we see that there are two goats involved. Uh, one will die, and one will be dismissed far from the camp. But, but Aaron begins the whole business of atonement by first making atonement for his own sin, for the sin of his family. We see this in verses 6 and verses 11. And so he, he makes atonement, he kills this, this bull, and he takes its blood, and then he marks out a path going back, going back into the Holy of Holies. He marks out this path with a cloud of smoke from a censer burning incense. It says this cloud has to cover his sin because it says in verse 13, if he doesn't do this, he'll die. Even, even in approaching him in worship, if we approach with sin, we deserve death. And so he comes in to the holy of holies or the most holy place, depending on your translation, and he lets the smoke precede him. And, and then as he enters, he's supposed to take that blood and he's supposed to sprinkle it and he's supposed to come around to the east side of the Ark of the Covenant on the mercy seat, the atonement cover. And it's called the atonement cover because of this day, because of these instructions. And he comes around to that right between the cherubim on the top there and he puts blood on the east side. Now, that seems incredibly specific. On the east side of the atonement cover of the ark, why? Why that specific? Well, back, back in, in verse 2, God tells us that he appears above the mercy seat. And so in a special way, his presence, his personal presence, in, in, in number 789, it tells us that that's where Moses meets and speaks with God. Well, his particular presence is there. That's where God dwells with his people. And in redeeming for himself a people, God's calling them out of their sin. He's calling them out of the fall, calling them back to him, back to where he once walked and talked with man, back to Eden. And if you remember in, in, in Genesis 3.24, when Adam and Eve are cast outside the Garden of Eden, they're cast out east of Eden on the east side. And so here God is paving a way for his people to come back to him, back to the place where we walk and talk and have relationship with God rightly. This is exactly why the, the, the designs in the tabernacle and, and later the temple are a garden. This is why there's cherubim on the top of the Ark of the Covenant because you remember when we're cast out of Eden, who guards the garden? cherubim. And so he's making atonement right where those cherubim are. And this is why Genesis starts with man kicked out east of Eden. And then Deuteronomy ends with God's people 
on the east side of the land looking to go back in where God will dwell with them. God is calling a people back to him, back to relationship with him. But atonement has to be done to provide for that closeness or God will destroy us. And so in verses 15 through 19, at the center of the center of the center of the Torah, we have explicit atonement described. Aaron slaughters the goat. Aaron atones for the people, the ark, the altar, the holy of holies, the tabernacle itself. And why, why does all that need to be atoned for? Because the, the picture we're getting is that the people's sin is rising up and it's encroaching on the temple itself. It's a threat to the presence of God. It's a threat to their right worship. The encroachment of sin is a threat for us all to right worship. Brothers and sisters, even our worship is flawed. It's a threat. It's threatened by our sin. See, Israel could cross every T. It could dot every I, keep every festival, wear frontlets on their forehead, and sin was still there flickering in their hearts as it is with us today. The side of heaven, that's always true. The answer is not, not in finding within ourselves more authentic worship, more authentic expression. No, but in the atonement that perfects our worship. That's the means by which we can approach God. That's the means by which our worship is is holy and righteous and good. We ought not to serve with with just attention drawn to ourselves and our feelings, but with laser focus upon the one who's provided a way back to him at such a great cost. Do you see the cost of your sin? Do you see the cost of atonement? Once Aaron has finished atoning for their worship, he takes the live goat and he lays both hands on this goat. Both hands. Now this is different from all the other occurrences in Leviticus where, where uh, someone brings a sacrifice and they lay one hand on it and it's not the priest doing it, it's the person bringing the sacrifice and they lay one hand on it as if to say this, this animal is my substitute, it's going to die in my, in, in my place. But, but now it's specific sin that's laid on the, the, the goat. So he lays both hands on this goat and he confesses all the sins of the people. These, these sins, in verse 21, are laid on this animal that has never sinned, that can't sin. And that goat is then led to a desolate place. The sacrificial goat has died for the sins. Now this goat, called the scapegoat since William Tyndall, uh, Tyndall uh, escape, uh, escape, right? This goat is the goat that escapes. Uh, This goat's then led to a desolate wilderness by a man appointed for the task. And it's his job to make sure that this goat does not come back to the camp, does not come back to the people. So whether he, like, leads it off a cliff or whether he, like, puts it just way out there and stands guard so he makes sure it doesn't come back and, I don't know, throws rocks at it or something, I, I don't know. But what we do know that this represents Israel's sin being cast far away from them, never to be seen again. As far as the east is from the west, their sin is cast away from them, and it will be no longer associated with them. Verses 23 and 28 tell us further how serious sin is. As Aaron exits from this ritual, he exits the Holy of Holies, he takes off his garments, he bathes himself, and then he he sacrifices both his ram and the ram for the people as burnt offerings. Because now he can approach and worship. A burnt offering is for worship, a sweet aroma going up to the Lord. And so he can worship rightly because sin has been dealt with. But further, there's this, this, this appointed man 
who, who, who led the goat into the wilderness. He, he also must wash his clothes. He also must wash himself. And not only do we see all this, this washing going on, you see, you see this, this other man who's appointed to, to take all the, 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 the parts of the sacrificial animals that, that were not used, and he's to take them outside the camp, and he's to burn them. And in the burning of them, he is now associated with the sin and the, and the bringing of these outside the camp. And so he, too, must bathe before he's able to associate with this holy people now. Why all the washing? Why, why all the burning? It's because the stain of sin must be completely removed. Sin is that destructive Sin is radioactive. And so don't, don't, don't laugh at sin. That's, that's exactly, in fact, you see that happening in the world a lot. We, we try to normalize sin by laughing at it. It's, it's not a joke to God. But, but, but further, don't minimize your sin. How often do we do that where we're like, well, I'm, I'm not like the abortion doctor. It's as, as a, I, I have to apologize a lot in my marriage because I'm, I'm a silly guy. My wife is long-suffering. Um, but it's like as though I to apologize to my wife and say in my apology, um... I'm not as bad as so-and-so's husband, so you should count your blessings. <laughs> That's what we're doing when we're minimizing sin. Don't minimize sin. Don't laugh at sin. Confess it. Deal with it. The Lord is merciful. And what the Lord details in this entire ritual are, are the two parts of the atonement. In 15 through 19, we see what the, the theologians call propitiation. Propitiation, pro means for or toward. Piate, mercy, pity. And what propitiation does, God uses the blood of this animal to, his, to assuage his wrath for sin. His wrath's poured out on that animal, and that blood talks as an a, 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 a appeasement a conciliation. It garners pity. It garners mercy toward us. Expiation is seen in verses 20 through 22, where that scapegoat escapes. It go, it's cast out. It, it departs. Expiation is the removal of sin. By God's mercy, it's taken out from us, away from us. Now, why is all that important? Well, in, in, in propitiation, God's attitude toward us changes completely. It changes from one of wrath, one of condemnation, to one of uh, being his enemy. To, it changes to one of love, acceptance, warmth, fatherly affection. And in expiation, our sins are remembered no more and our guilt is gone Forever, as far as the east is from the west. And many, many of you are struggling with guilt from old sin. You may have even come to love and be so familiar with your shame that it seems like a friend, but it's not. Beloved, in, in the gospel, God has dealt with your sin because he has so loved you. Because if you're in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that's what brings us to our third point, most fully and finally in Christ. In verse 29, we see that this is to be a lasting or, or permanent statute for Israel. In fact, we, 
He's so clear about that. He says that in 29, he repeats it in 31 in the middle of that paragraph. Then he repeats it again at the end in 34. So he really wants them to know this is to be permanent. This is to be perpetual. It's to be constantly happening. Why? Because they'll keep sinning. And because the blood of bulls and goats is is not enough to atone for all their sin and all the sin that they will do. And that's exactly why the destruction of the temple is so earth-shattering. The loss of the ark is so terrible for them because it ends the ability for God to dwell in their midst. It ends the ability for atonement to take place for them to be God's people, for him to dwell with them and for them to go to him, to approach him. All that is gone when that's destroyed. But let's bring that to us. Do you see how dire our situation is? Do you see our need before God? Because God does not change. It's not like you flip the page from Leviticus to Matthew and and God has suddenly changed in his disposition by by means of Prozac or something like that. No. No, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will therefore treat sin and he will treat careless approaches before him in the same manner that he treated Nadab and Abihu. We stand condemned in our sin before God. Do you understand that? Do you know the weight of your sin? Because it's serious, it's deathly serious. We are ruined. We are helpless before him. We will be cut off. We will go to hell. Because that's what we deserve. That's what God's holy justice demands. But that's not where it ends. 2,000 years ago, the Son of God himself approached us. We, he, he didn't say, hey, you need to approach me in this special way, and then this extra special way, then we'll... we'll no, he came to us, and he came to us not to exact and pour out wrath. No, he came to us humbly, in abject humility, a king riding a donkey into Jerusalem, walking toward his death, and he came and he immediately enters the temple because he's more than our king. He's our priest. And he's more than our priest. He is our atoning sacrifice. That's what Romans 3.25 says. He pleads his blood for his people. He dies on the cross as a substitute for sinful people and God pours his wrath out upon his beloved and precious son. Do you see how he loves you? God has provided these these temporary signs that we read about in Leviticus 16. These temporary sacrifices as an early proclamation of a great and final sacrifice that came to us in Jesus Christ. You see, just like at the center of the Torah, you don't have law, you have atonement. At the center of the Bible, you don't have a list of commands, you have a Savior. A Savior who demonstrates the perfect character of God and a Savior who gives his life up willingly for his people. We all like sheep had gone astray and just as Aaron lays the people's sin on the head of the goat, the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. This is called penal substitutionary atonement. It's important that we get that down. Penal, he takes the punishment, substitutionary, in our place, atonement. We are made right with God. We can have fellowship with him again because of it. God the Father crushed his son, hanging on the cross in our place to satisfy the just requirement of his holy law. Do you see how much he loves you? There's nothing that he has withheld from us. He has given his son for you.
And yet there are those who diminish this doctrine and despise what it teaches because they don't want to worship a God who has wrath towards sinners. But do you remember the problem when you don't think that you need to be forgiven? What happens? Your love diminishes. You don't wor worship rightly. You don't love rightly. You don't despise sin as you should. And worse, your God doesn't love you. He just tolerates you. No, but in Christ, God has loved us so much he sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for us. God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you believe that? Do you know that? Hebrews 9 and 10 is God's commentary on Leviticus 16. I'd encourage you to, to read that this week. But I, I, as we come to a close, I, I want us to look at Hebrews 9, 11 through 14. I have it on the screen for you there as well. But Christ has appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come. And the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. In other words, the, 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 the tabernacle that, that Israel worshipped at was a copy of the heavenly throne room. And Christ enters that throne room, and he entered the most holy place once and for all time, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a young cow sprinkling on those who are defiled sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our consciences from dead works so that we can serve the living God, so that we can worship the living God, so that we can have fellowship with the living God. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is a better high priest than Aaron because he's sinless, because he can enter that most holy of place with his own reputation, with his own record. He has no need to atone for his own sins. He has direct access to the Father. His worship is perfect. His prayers are perfect because he is perfect. Now, brothers and sisters and friends, don't ever think, I, 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 I talk to a lot of people as a pastor, and I hear people say, well, pray for me because you've got a better access point to God than I do. No! No, if you're united to Christ, his prayers are better than my prayers. His prayer, prayers are better than any priest's prayers. Come boldly, pray boldly, worship boldly because of what Christ has afforded for us in the cross. And it's in light of that very reality. And, and, and Hebrews 9 goes on to Hebrews 10. He's saying, arguing from the same point, and he says, Therefore, let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. It's on that basis of the cross, on the basis of what Christ has accomplished, that we're to gather regularly and we're to encourage one another and exhort one another based on the gospel of what Christ has accomplished for us. Are you doing that? Are you gathering regularly? And when you gather, are you just darting out the door? Are you exhorting the brothers and sisters? Are you confessing your sins to one another? Are you reminding each other of the truth of the gospel that God has loved you so much in Christ that he has paid for that sin? How are you encouraging others in the congregation with the finished work of Christ? But the author of Hebrews goes on, Christ is the perfect sacrifice for our sins. He closes the book in Hebrews 13 and in 11 through 12, he says this, referencing the Day of Atonement. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the most holy place by the high priest as a sin offering are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the gate so that he might sanctify the people by his own blood. 
He was killed outside the city because he took on our sin. All of our sins. Because he can bear them all. He suffers the just condemnation for our sin and he carries it on himself to a desolate grave. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. And because of that, we now have perfect fellowship with God because of that perfect obedience. Moreover, Christ rose again and ever lives to plead for his people. He pleads his blood for us until the day when he returns and he will bring Eden back with him. No more corruption. No more unclean emissions. No more disease, but joy and fellowship with God forever. Do you know him? Because this is ours in Christ and in Christ alone. There is no atonement outside of Christ. If you are not united to him, dear unbelieving friend, you, you, you stand condemned before God, just like all of us stand condemned before God outside of Christ. Either you will face judgment united to Christ and he experiences it for you, or you will experience that judgment on your own. Turn to Christ. I beg you, turn to Christ today in faith and repentance. Brothers and sisters and friends, all that God demands, he has provided for his people most fully and finally in Christ. So let us walk in fear and trembling and love for the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. May we delight in Jesus today. May we see the cost of our sin. And may we despise sin. And may we worship you rightly. Lord, may, we, may our worship go with us throughout the week. And may we call our neighbors to this atoning sacrifice in Jesus. Thank you for the cross. We pray in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Would you stand as we close this morning? Sing with me, Man of Sorrows. Man of Sorrows, what a name for with a benediction from Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace who brought 
up from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with everything good to do his will, working in us what is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you.